everybody shows her face a bit or yeah yeah maybe it would be good just if you could turn your cameras on we can see you all there you are you were there <laughs> stuck there. in your hotel room or um at home yep great great good to see you guys yeah that's better Okay, so this session, I'm going to, as I said, I'm recording it and then I'll, I will upload it to the learning management system so that you can have a chance to, uh, to go over um, some of the details. And um, it's gonna be a bit challenging because Lewis has to multitask and um, he also has to try to deliver something, I guess a class or about technical aspects of using cameras over Zoom. So this this class would be actually be much much better if we were all in the same room and um, you had cameras in front of you and you could actually play around with the cameras but because we can't do that right now with covid we have to be get creative and come up with this this workaround so let's try and see how it goes and um, it's a bit of an experiment but it should be fun so with Luis Really, with that, I think it's over to you. Yes, okay, thanks, Brendan. Hello, everybody, good to see you guys again after I heard your uh, presentations uh, one week ago, I think. Um, so we're gonna do our camera workshop. I've been working on this for a long time and it's uh, there's lots of challenges to do this. As Brendan said, it will be so, so easy to do this if we are in the same room. And it's interesting and challenging to do it like this. Uh, so I'll, I'll just ask a little bit for your patience because I will be switching between uh, many uh, content elements. Uh, so I just, if at some point we take a little bit of time, I just ask you for your patience um, and we'll just keep going and um, hopefully it will all go well. Uh, to start with, I just want to uh, ask you a few things for the class to do. So if, uh, at some point, I, I, I am hoping to get a little bit of interaction with you as much as possible and have you uh, saying things, uh, sharing your ideas, sharing what you're thinking, sharing your reaction to what you're seeing. So at some points, maybe I will just ask you to like, uh, what do you think? Is this yes or no? Maybe you can say yes. And maybe you, you do like a yes, like a thumbs up or no and a thumbs down kind of thing. And uh, at some points, I would also like to just ask at least one or two pe people for uh, what they are thinking or what's their, um, what's your uh, opinion or something, or guess something. So I will maybe just uh, randomly choose somebody uh, to ask a bit of questions, right? Is that okay? Say yes. Good, okay, yeah, that's great. Uh, and uh, also I wanted to ask you about the photographers. I think you guys kind of, I mean, we're hoping that everybody will um, learn to use the camera, but I think you guys already decided more or less there's gonna be uh, one photographer in each team. So I just wanted to ask you, which is, who is the photographer of each team a bit quickly, if, if I may. And also something else, I am I may gonna refer to your teams as, the, as your topic, because it's kind of easy to keep it in my mind. So I'm gonna refer as the, Bog team, the Okinawa team, the gender team, and the poverty team, okay? So let's see. So in the Bog team, who is the photographer? Is it here? Yes. Okay, Kaori-san. Kaori. Good. Uh, I think you said you had uh, a bit of experience or you are very into photography, right? Yes, but just as, as a hobby. Okay, no worries. Hopefully you will know a lot more <laughs> today. Uh, how about Okinawa team? Who is the photographer? It's not here today. Oh, I think it's me. Oh, what, okay. what did you say? I couldn't hear what you said. Yes, the photographer of the Okinawa team. Oh, no, it's not Okinawa. So I will are... be in charge of... Um, the photography of a homeless person. The poverty in Osaka. 
Oh, yes, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> you are Minako, right? Mm -hmm. Minako, okay. How about the Okinawa photographer? No, not here today. How about the Okinawa team? Somebody I think, can- they... I'm sorry, I, I think uh, it's Susumu-san, but he cannot turn on his microphone. Okay, and Alfredo is the director, I think. Yes. Maybe, yeah. Gender, team, who is the photographer? There's two people, me and Anna. Yes. Fabi and Anna. Anna. There is Anna. Is the name. Anna. It's Anna Haspater. <laughs> uh, okay, I see, I see. Anna. All right, awesome. That's great. Good. So let's uh, let's go. Let's uh, give it a go. <laughs> let's try. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And uh, hopefully, okay. So today we have we are going to have a, a, a different types of contents that I'm going to show you. I'm going to be showing you a presentation uh, for the workshop, and uh, I'm going to be showing you to my camera here. My camera, what my camera is viewing. Can you see like a doll, like a wooden doll? Yes, good, very good, Javi. You are following instructions. <laughs> okay, that's good. And uh, I'm gonna show you some photos too. Some, sorry, some pic, some uh, movies. Okay, so without further ado, let's go for the presentation. Okay. All right. Um, so I am Luis Patron, in case you guys don't remember. Um, and uh, I mean, this this topic of uh, this topic of using the camera is is vast. I mean, it's impossible to doing in an hour and a half too much about it. But my idea to make the most use of this time is to cover really the basics uh, of uh, shooting with a video camera. Um, because uh, this you have to get right, right? It's it's uh, it's it's maybe a, a better objective to think of getting the basics right initially than thinking of getting some awesome uh, shots or photography or really avant-garde things going. Um, we have to really cover the basics because if you do mistakes on the basics, it's gonna really be like a glaring uh, mistake on your video that you cannot save. If, if you don't have so like amazing shots, it's okay, you can still tell your story, but if you have really uh, bad technical mistakes, it's really terrible and maybe you really cannot tell your story. So we're gonna cover the basics. Maybe some of these you know already and uh, uh, maybe for a lot of people it's new knowledge. So we're gonna cover these basics and I'm gonna mention some advanced topics and frequently asked questions and common mistakes. We may not go very deep into those, so just make a note and you can uh, Google them later, or I, you can actually uh, ask me later through email or in some other way. And I will be happy to uh, elaborate on this, uh, especially in, in the context of your actual project, right? So I'm gonna jump right in and we're gonna start by uh, watching a little video. Uh, so until now, I think you have, you have learned many things uh, with Kit and Brendan. Uh, about the types of documentaries you can make and uh, maybe storytelling and this kind of thing. Today, we're gonna see more about the actual technical aspects of using the camera. So I'm gonna be showing you some movies and it's okay, you can pay attention to the story a bit, but don't get too much into the story. Look more at the, how the images are being shot, what images are being shown. Uh, if, it's, if we are showing a wide image, a very close up image, uh, if it's sharp, if it's not sharp, well lit, light, these kind of things, more than the story, but keep that story on the on your mind uh, also, but more on the technical side of things. So here we are gonna go jump into the first thing. It's a piece, I, uh, it's a very short piece, a two, three minutes, it's, I think it's a one, it's a two minute piece, I think. I shot for NHK Digital, uh, sorry, for CNN Digital uh, some time ago. So just uh, pay attention of how the camera is, is working, okay? 
game. Okay, it's called Inside Japan, only all female sushi house. So maybe the gender team will like this one. Okay. Okay, so I'm back here. Can you guys see me? Yep. Okay, great. So let's just, um, I'm just gonna ask a couple of questions. For example, let's take uh, uh, Hadi-san. So what types of shots or images did you see in this video that you can think of? Just, just say whatever, this, all these things is new to you guys. Not just you, Hadi, but everybody when I ask you a question, just, just tell us uh, whatever you are thinking and we'll discuss, okay? So what types of images did you, did you see, for example? Close up of the woman making sushi. Okay, making sushi, so it's action, action, right? Action, okay. Close up, just focus on the hand. Okay, close up of elements, okay. something else? The interior of the shop. Okay, the environment. The location, I guess, right? Location. Yes. yes. Okay, let's ask somebody else if they can think somebody, something else. For example, Kaori san, Kaori Ogawa san. Mm. Anything else you can think uh, of? Swimming in chef's hands. Okay. And also Tokyo town's atmosphere. Tokyo town atmosphere, awesome, very good. That's very good. Okay, there's one. Okay, there's one that you guys are missing. The interview. There's an interview, right? So yes, you got it right. There is. Um, uh, let's let me get back to the presentation. So. Yes, so you, we have di uh, dialogues or interviews, right? So we have the interview, the person is speaking, it's talking, it's telling their story, and we, uh, we learn everything from, from her interview, right? We see action shots, as Hadi said, the, the, they are making the sushi, there's close-ups of elements. Um, and uh, so that I will call action, that's the second thing. There's something we call B-roll. Uh, this, this comes from a long time ago when actually you had a roll and B roll when you were using tapes to actually put TV programs together. Now we don't use tapes anymore, but I guess uh, they used to call A roll to the main things like the interviews and B roll to the other things. So B roll we 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 uh, call other elements uh, that are in in the that are happening in the location. And uh, finally, we have general views. GVs we call them often. General views, uh, like Kaori said, like Kaori said. Uh, for example, something very important is uh, we call them establishing shots, actually, because it established the location, right? Uh, where are we? Uh, often, when you see when you start a new scene, you will see a, a shot of the maybe neighborhood, or if we are first time going into that city, you see a shot of the city, and then you go into closer to the to the person in the story, right? So there's all these uh, types of um, types of uh, content, right? And also, uh, this content has certain characteristics, which is what we're going to learn uh, mostly today. Uh, what the different shots that you see, that you saw, are uh, are sharp, are in focus. They are properly lit, right? Uh, it's it's enough light. It's not too dark. It's not too bright, and they are stable, right? These three key points, and this is some of the things that make it stand out and make it more professional, right? So this is what we're gonna learn a lot about these characteristics of how to make your, your uh, video sharp, well lit and stable today, okay? Um, so there's um, several elements to achieve that. And uh, this is kind of the, the content of the presentation. We'll see if we can get through all of this, um, but we can always talk later. So we're gonna talk about focus. We're gonna talk about exposure, which is uh, how much light is hitting your, um, centering the camera. We're gonna talk about length, focal length, framing, 
uh, stability to tripods and a little bit about sound and light, okay? So let's start with uh, focusing, right? So um, let me get um, out and show you this. Dude, I'm like, yes, I'm here. Okay, I'm back here. So basically uh, when we're talking about uh, photography on the operation of a camera, what you have, it's, um, it's several variables that you can change right it's it's a it's a machine this this camera and uh, it allows you to adjust several variables of your image right and uh, so today what we're going to see it's what each of these variables how they affect your image and how you can do to uh, get like a really good um, professional as much as possible image by moving these uh, these levers this um, these controls, right? So I'm going to explain you these variables one by one, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you what impact those have on your image. <clears throat> okay. So the first of them is focusing, right? So uh, with focusing, and this may be very, uh, you guys may think is very basic, uh, but it's very important, right? So by focusing, what we are trying to achieve is to have a sharp, sharp image, sharp video, right? You don't need, no, not all your image needs to be sharp, but the key point that you are trying to show should be sharp, definitely, right? So here, um, you have one variable that you are adjusting mainly, which is uh, you tell the camera the distance that you are, the camera to the subject, right? Are you at... Uh, 50 centimeters, are you at two meters, three meters, seven meters? Are you at like a hundred meters from the subject? And then the camera adjusts, um, like you see in the, in the image here, you have the camera on the left uh, here, there is a distance. And then the rabbit here, it's sharp, right? Um, because that's uh, how you set your, your lens, right? You, you told the lens that the rabbit is at this distance. And in this image, you can see that the grass and the trees are represented as gray because they are outside of the area that the image will be sharp, right? So that will be a bit blurry or a lot or very blurry depending on all variables, uh, but only the rabbit will be sharp in this shot, right? Um, okay, so that's the basic idea. So uh, I'll, I'm gonna demonstrate that a bit. So, this, so you have your camera here and uh, most lenses, actually most lenses will only, this is the only thing you can control on the lens manually in many lenses still, but there are many lenses that are not manual anymore and you can only control them um, electronically, but most lenses, if they're professional, they allow you to control the, the distance you are from the, from the subject, which is one of these rings here. This because it's a zoom lens, it has another ring that allows you to, to zoom in and out. But if it's not a zoom lens, all the lens will only have this adjustment for uh, to tell the camera where is their subject, no? where is your rabbit. So I'm going to show you now how that looks in the camera. Okay, so here we are. So this is what my camera is seeing now. And so I mean, manual focus here and, um, okay, let me adjust here. Controls. Okay. So I'm adjusting the exposure here too, but, okay. So, okay, so we have this image here and um, this is a, a controller that uh, from my computer can control the camera. This is kind of the same thing that you will see in the camera. So for you to, you should concentrate on three things here. Look at the image here, right? Look at the, at the image in the center of the interface. Then you have this area here on the left that is showing you uh, different uh, 
adjustments that you're doing in the camera and we're gonna go into each one of those later. And you have this area here on the left, on the right, sorry, right down that is telling you uh, how much light is coming into the camera, right? Okay. So uh, basically what you can see there, okay, maybe I can just uh, ask somebody, how about uh, Minako-san? Yes. So what is uh, in focus there? What is sharp? Um, the people's head. Okay. So the, 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 this, doll per, this doll here is what is closer to the lens, right? So we are telling the camera that um, we should be, the sharpness should be here at this length, not here. You, what you can see in the background there, is that sharp? Mm -hmm. It's not sharp, right? It's just like a blurry, blurry thing because we're telling the camera that it should focus on this one. So if we tell the camera to focus on the thing on the back, now we have the doll that went, went uh, out of focus and we have the plant in the background, now it's sharp, right? So this is basically the, the variable that you are controlling to uh, when you are um, focusing, basically. You are telling just the distance at which the, your subject is. Yeah? And So um, the idea here is that, as I was saying, you should keep your main subject sharp. And this may sound like uh, duh, yes, of course, obvious, but it's not so, sometimes it's not so easy actually, right? Um, for a variety of reasons, you can, you're, you can lose the, the focus of, the, of your main subject and uh, it's, it looks pretty bad. If you are, for example, shooting an interview and your main subject goes out of focus, then uh, it looks pretty bad. Maybe you cannot use it, right? If no, there's a little mistake, and uh, your your subject is out of out of focus. You maybe not. You, you maybe cannot use that interview, which is pretty bad, right? Or you can only use the audio. So one way to do this is to make sure that the eyes of the person you are shooting are sharp. Okay. So especially when you are shooting uh, interviews, you may you may uh, you may. Uh, be sharp on um, on some other area of the person, but if, if the eyes are not sharp, somehow that looks bad. No? Uh, and especially when you are, especially when you are dealing with very very uh, very tight focus, we say that only only very only a, a very uh, very uh, limited part of the image is sharp. Then it's very easy to go out of focus very easily, right? Like in my image here that you are seeing, everything is out of focus, right? Everything is sharp, uh, but if we switch to the like the image we had before with the doll, you you saw that just very few things were sharp, right? So you have just you have to really be careful with that. Although it's so basic, it, it can happen many times. So some tools that you have to do that it's well, of course you can always use automatic focusing, which is um, what I am using now. So. I'm just selecting in my camera with um, with um, my finger where this image should be sharp and it just goes there. It's very easy, right? I used to do everything manually actually before and I would shoot full movies all manually before because autofocus was not so good. But now depending on the camera, it, uh, the autofocus can be really good. This, this Canon camera is very good. So I just uh, use that all the time. So that's one tool that you may want to use. Another tool that is really useful if you are not sure if your image is sharp is magnification. Okay, so Yes, okay, so this, what it does, this is like, it zooms really intensely into some area of the image, and then you can really make sure if this image is sharp or not, right? So I use this a lot uh, with the eyes of people until I get it right. You see that the tech, you can see the texture of the wood now, right? Or if we wanna be focusing on the back, on that like lamp thing, 
and then we go out. You can go even further down, and then you go out and you are sure that that thing is sharp. So this is another um, another way to do this. And uh, uh, in general, of course, you can always just do the uh, automatic focusing. And for maybe for you guys, initially, you should try in general to use the camera in automatic. And maybe the camera is going to get um, the camera is going to get maybe eighty percent of the time right uh, with automatic. So at the beginning, maybe it's a good idea to use automatic because you will be thinking about too many things. But there will be times when there is like a tricky shot that may will need you to do it actually um, more, uh, getting to the camera and do it yourself. Um, yes, so. So it's properly executed and you don't make a mistake or you may want to do something really cool uh, and you will want to actually have control of the levers of the camera. Okay. And uh, yes, so what I tend to use a lot with uh, my own camera and uh, this will depend on what camera you use. And I mean, you cannot even use your, your mobile phone too, actually, uh, but uh, you have to uh, study your camera a bit and decide um, what is the, the, the best setting to use. But what a setting that I like to use a lot is a setting that follows the face of people. So you see that it's following the, and keeping this, this doll sharp, right? Even it's moving a lot. It's, it keeps tracking it. We call it tracking. And uh, I use this thing all the time now. Yeah. So for example, um, even in interviews, sometimes people uh, can go back and forth. So that they are like, uh, starts like this and, they're, and then they come back like this, they do this and they are moving. So uh, it's, this feature is useful to keep following them. Or for some uh, shots, for example, like I'm thinking for example on the voguing team that will need to follow some dancers, maybe some performance. Some feature like this will help to keep uh, the key uh, dancer maybe sharp. Yes. Yes, so as I was saying, the main variable here is this distance to the subject, uh, but I light a little bit to make it more simple for you uh, because there's other variables that we're gonna uh, uh, learn next because they have to do more with uh, lighting the subject more than with focusing, but it also affects focusing, which is um, the lens focal length and the aperture. Okay. Um, yes. So depending on these things that I'm going to explain you in the next uh, section, actually, uh, you can um, amplify this uh, depth of field, we call it. Um, you can amplify the area of the, the image that is sharp, depending on a couple of variables more that I'm going to explain you next. But um, yeah, one is the, the actual lens that you use. So this lens and this lens have different, um, not only uh, it, it's closer and further away from the image, but also does something else to the image, like uh, how sharp it is in what areas. No? So we're going to learn this late afterwards. After this, uh, after this section, okay. I don't know any questions here. I, this is uh, the end of this section. I don't know if I'm, somebody has some question about it, um, or some comment. Um, so good. On, on auto focus, I've used it a lot, and I agree it's a good way to start. But the, one of the things I found is that. Um, with autofocus, if there's movement in the background, then uh, the camera will automatically shift to whatever's moved to, to focus on whatever's moving in the background there. So I've been caught out filming something and thinking I had the person in perfect focus when someone behind started moving and uh, it shifted. So you have to, it's a bit tricky. Yeah, that's exactly an example of the 20% where the autofocus doesn't work. So it's like, as I was saying, 80% of the time it would work, but then uh, this 20%, that's the perfect example, right? Of uh, 
you are not necessarily trying to do anything very amazing. You just want to get that thing sharp, but there's something that prevents you from doing that. So on, on, on this occasion, you will need to do something uh, using more manual controls. Right. Okay. Is that good? Yep. Thank you. All right. So moving forward, we have the other um, part or element that is very important in all of this is uh, what we call exposure, right? So exposure, we, we say exposure because we are basically exposing the, the sensor of the camera to the light, right? To the light of the image that you are shooting. So the objective here is of course to have a visible in detail what you're trying to shoot, visible in detail now, so it's well lit. It's not too bright that it goes white and it's not too dark that it goes black. Uh, it's somewhere in the middle that is uh, like a um, pleasant image to watch and you can also see all the all the detail of, that you are trying to portray, right? So, and if you think of the video that I just showed, you could see everything clearly, right? So that's the, that's the objective here. Yeah? So you have a few variables here. You have four main variables here, which is, um, and uh, the, all of these variables, what they do is to allow uh, more or less light into the sensor, right? The main, the main uh, objective of this is to have, is to allow more light or less light into the sensor, right? That's the main objective. But each of these uh, variables too affect the image in another way, not just on the brightness of the image, right? So uh, I'm gonna tell you all this. So basically the first one is aperture, which is um, how much uh, the lens has a diaphragm inside and it opens or closes. So of course, if it opens wide, it allows a lot of light. If it closes very small, it lets in less light, right? And uh, um, I hope this doesn't go too much over your head, like it's too much information, but uh, this, uh, we call them F-stop numbers. You know? This. Uh, uh, how much open or closed is this uh, aperture? It's measured in f-stop numbers. Okay, that's that's just how we call it. Um, and um, okay, Let me go back to my camera. Yes. So um, most lenses you cannot control that uh, manually anymore. Uh, you can you have to control them electronically, but this but this is what you see here. You see that again this left panel of controls, and this thing you see here, 2.8, 3.2, 3.5. That's what is called the f-stop number, right? So 2.8 is already quite bright, uh, but we can close it, and as you can see, it's affecting the image, right? It's making it a lot darker. Can you see that? So the, if, the, if the number is small, we um, are letting more light in into the sensor. And if, the, and if this f-stop number is uh, big, so like 2.8 is uh, very, is quite wide open, it's quite bright. And if we close it, if we send it to like 20, 22, then it's almost no light coming in or very little, right? And uh, I won't explain you this too much now, but you can see this graph here on the, on the right side that is changing as we are allowing more or less light into the sensor, right? I will exp explain that a bit later. Uh, but so that's the main thing that this thing is doing, but it's also having a secondary effect, right? And I'm gonna show you this again with this doll. So, okay, so let's try um, let's uh, go sharp on the doll. Okay, so now the doll is sharp and we see that we are, uh, our f-stop is 2.8, so we're allowing a lot of light into the sensor. Um, and what uh, can you see on the background is that the background is quite blurry, okay? 
So uh, we can get this kind of same level of exposure, same level of light with a different combination of variables, right? So we can go quite close and I'm gonna move this variable that I'm gonna explain to you next. Okay, yeah, okay. So it's a little bit. Okay, more or less. So more or less is the same brightness of the image, right? But you see that these numbers are totally different. Now we are on an F14 and I'm gonna explain you what is this next, um, but See that we are on F14 and the background is actually a lot more clear now, actually. Can you see that? Do you notice that? Yes? Everything there? Yes. So this is the secondary effect of the F-stop number. Yeah? The, the wider you open, the, 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 more, uh, the more the background goes out of focus, basically, to explain it in a simple way. The more you close it, everything is sharp, right? Like, uh, like my image here, like my image here, everything is sharp, right? So in, for example, I don't know, let's uh, see what guys, what you guys think in wh what, what can this be useful for, right? What can this moving this variable be useful for in your movie, for example, let's pick somebody. Uh, how about uh, uh, Susumo or if he's not there, Alfredoson? How would this uh, moving, Having more um, sharp area or less sharp area could be used to be helpful for you. Um, I don't know if Sumo-san can use his microphone, so I will say what what I guess. Okay. Uh, it could be. I think it could be useful to uh, focus the attention on different uh, scenes and different uh, in different. I, I would say. Um, well, things that are in the field of view of the camera. <clears throat> Good. Yes. And how about the, um, yes, okay. So you mean that shallow, uh, if you have uh, just a few things that are sharp, then you will concentrate on those, right? Is that what you mean? Yes. And also about letting more light into the image or less light. Uh, it could help also, I guess, to, um, capture movement. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that is a variable, that one or, or the next one, which is... Um, That's the next one. The, the, okay. the shorter bit. Okay. Yeah, we'll go there soon. But yes, just to conclude this point. Yes, so if, if, the, if only a few things are uh, sharp, you will concentrate on those, right? And the, and, the, and the rest will just be like a decoration in a way. But you will concentrate on what is sharp. Uh, if everything is sharp, also is helpful because then you don't have to worry about something going uh, blurry, right? So for example, if you really, if you have a complicated scene, like, uh, um, like the bogging people again, uh, bogging team, bogging um, dancers, there's maybe a complicated scene where everybody's dancing, it's a huge thing and you want everything sharp, you are, it's maybe easier for you to, to just have everything sharp instead of trying to, to be very shallow uh, depth of field. So that we use that for that purpose. So the second variable here is the shutter speed, which is um, how much this, this hole that you see here that it opened the aperture, how, uh, how long time is gonna be open, right? So if you keep it open for a long time, there's lots of light coming in on your image, right? If you uh, just very quickly open and close, very few uh, light will come in again, right? So it has a similar effect of uh, limiting the amount of light, uh, but again, it has another, um, another uh, secondary effect, which is uh, if your speed is a bit low, and if you are shooting, for example, say you are shooting uh, a sportsman uh, running or sports cars going really fast, but you, are, but you are shooting at a low speed, your, your image will look a bit blurry, okay? And if you shoot at high speed, you will freeze this, you will freeze the movement very sharply, right? 
So sometimes you may want a little bit of blur and, and sometimes you, pref you would prefer to be uh, uh, very sharp, okay? The third variable that we have is the ISO, which is the sensitivity of the sensor, okay? The sensor we have here. And uh, um, normally they have a base ISO and this ISO it's um, uh, what in the, the setting in which the camera performs the best. So let me see if we can see it here. Can we see ISO? Yes, okay, here is ISO. So ISO, we have it here is 800, okay? So again, if we uh, decrease the sensitivity of the sensor, of course, the image will go a bit darker. If we increase the sensitivity of the sensor, the image will go brighter, right? That's the effect this has. And this one, normally you are not, uh, changing it all the time. This is something maybe you set at the beginning and you stick with it, but sometimes you may want to change it. Yeah? And uh, the secondary effect you get here, let me see if I can show you. Let's go to some crazy ISO setting. to make this work. Yeah, it's maybe gonna be difficult to see, yeah, because this is just, yeah, maybe this is not, uh, it's difficult to, to appreciate, but basically the more, the more, the higher you go with the ISO is gonna start degrading the image basically, okay? Because you are artificially uh, trying to rescue information, um, bumping up the brightness of the image artificially, digitally, and then this degrades the image and you see a lot of, we call them artifacts. I don't know if it's visible here, let's see. It's maybe difficult to see. But the higher you go, the, the more the image degrades. And it's difficult to appreciate here. A little bit you can see, it's maybe, it's, uh, it's maybe not so easy to see for the untrained eye. Yeah, like that, you see? So you start to see this type of, um, this type of degrading of the image. If, let's, let's go back to something more um, lower, I assume. Can we do that? Yes. So you can see there's a lot less artifacts here, right? This is it's not very, yeah, okay, there you go. Okay, there you could see more. So you don't see these uh, color artifacts? Is, is, could you notice the difference? So yes, there's, there's no grainy. So the grainy is yeah. artifact. Exactly, grain, we would, we, when, we were, when we were shooting uh, with film, we would call grain, but now we call them artifacts, right? Just like these digital artifacts. So we don't see them as much, right? So this is what you, um, um, the, the effect it has. And then since Hadi is already there, <laughs> so how, how, should, how can you use this knowledge when you are shooting, for example? Of, of, uh, if you put, in what situation, for example, would you use a high ISO? Like in, in what situation you may want to increase the sensitivity of the sensor? Maybe if it's not focused, maybe in Shibuya causing Shibuya scramble, we can make use IS, high ISO to make it all people can see. But if I start focus, maybe okay. it become grainy. Yeah. Okay, somebody else has an idea? When could you use a high sensitivity of your sensor? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> oh, I think it can help to capture images in darker environments. Ping pong. <laughs> yes, exactly. So that, that's the main reason you want to use a uh, high ISO because you are gonna be shooting in dark situations and then uh, maybe your lens cannot 
um, is not as good enough to see what's going on, then you will crank up the ISO. And it will degrade a bit the image, but you will still be able to get an image, right? So as, as I started in this presentation, um, what we are trying to have is enough material to tell your story. So if it's dark uh, and you don't shoot because it's dark, then you don't have that footage and you cannot tell that story, that message, right? So uh, you can crank up the ISO and maybe it's not the best uh, image, it's not the best footage because it's very grainy, but you can still um, shoot it, right? So that's why we, that's when we use ISO. That's how we use ISO. All right. Um, and uh, okay, I'm gonna jump on this frame rate thing because maybe too complicated. I can explain you later. But basically, again, um, I recommend you to use um, the automatic setting to start with, and you will get like 80% of the time right things. And in this case, what you have, because what, what we discuss is that there's two main variables, the, um, the aperture, aperture and the speed at which this aperture opens. So you have two variables. So what you will see many times in your controls here of the camera, uh, like it's difficult to see, but um, you, you can set the camera in different modes and the uh, two modes is gonna be, um, we call them is priority, right? Is aperture priority or shutter speed priority. So what do you want? No? If you use all manual, you have to set this uh, by yourself. Yeah. You have to tell the camera exactly what you want. You have to tell them, I want 1 25th of a second of aperture of, sorry, of shutter speed. And I want an F5 um, aperture, right? But you can set this too at, um, for example, this is aperture, aperture priority. And uh, now I just only have to set the aperture. I change the aperture and then the camera will adjust the image. Okay. Yeah, so I, okay. So I change the aperture you see that uh, the, the brightness kind of doesn't change, but um, I am changing this uh, aperture, the f-stop number. And as you saw, the, the, this, this thing is becoming, everything is sharp, right? So the camera is automatically setting up the, the shutter speed, right? So if we go back to the, big aperture we had before. Again, we see, although we have, as, as we saw before, oops. as we saw before, uh, the thing, the background goes blurry, okay? So that's the automatic aperture. And the counterpart is the um, priority for speed. It's called TV, as you can see here. Yeah. So you set the speed. For example, if we set it quite low, let's see what happens. If we, if we, if we um, set it quite low, we can see that the movement is blurred, right? But if we set it quite high, we see that the, the movement is more, I mean, it's, yeah. There is not this blurriness, right? There's a lack in the signal um, through the Wi-Fi, but there is no blurriness. You notice? Because we are here in one, two hundredth of a second, right? If we go back to a lower speed, again, it's blurry, okay? Yes, okay. I wanted to show, let me see if I have money. We still have time. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a bit um, 
uh, movie to exemplify a bit what we just saw. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna, this is, it's one scene of a documentary I made for NHK. I made it two years ago, but it's all about wearing masks in Japan because um, two years ago uh, in Japan, people maybe wore a lot of masks compared to other countries, although now it's maybe not so rare because now all the world is wearing masks. But I did this documentary about the culture of wearing masks in Japan. And I'm gonna show you a little clip, uh, one scene of uh, a YouTuber that dances with the mask on. Now it's maybe nothing special because everybody wearing masks, but at that time it was a bit weird because he wouldn't show his, his face on his YouTube channel, okay? behind a mask sometimes empowers people to follow their dreams. マスクジョーリーのパフォーマーとやっぱ自分も歌ってやってるので、にとってマスクとはある意味いろいろ本音や自分の表現したいことをあのすごくクリアに表現してみんなに届けられていると僕は思ってます。マジメ is an up and coming dancer trying to make a name for himself with his distinctive masked look. After years of perseverance cultivating an audience, he's gathered 20,000 followers online. Millions have watched his self-produced dance performance videos.最初はその見た目とかじゃなくてそのダンスやパフォーマンス自体をすごく見てる人たちに見てほしくて見た目じゃなくその内容で知っていただけたらなと思ってたんですけどなんかいつの間にかこのマスクだったりその仮面がなん
So you see he's a bit brighter than the background. So again, that uh, makes, uh, makes us more concentrate on him. Yeah? And uh, as you rightly said after, after we show that, we already saw the location. So we don't need to show the location sharply every time. We can show an image like this that is also interesting and pleasant and it, it makes us concentrate on him. And uh, also like uh, this uh, interview too. I mean, in, interviews will, I, I, this is a classic way I would shoot almost all the interviews. It's uh, you, you have the subject very clearly lit, very sharp and you have a very blurry background that still you can know what it is, right? You know that it's a graffiti. Uh, you saw the guy arriving in the scene. So you know where he is already. Uh, so it, it just uh, goes with his personality, right? You wanna have something like that on the background, but it's, I am using all these variables, right? He's sharp and lit. The background is lit, but unsharp. Yeah? Um, Yes, so this is how you use all these variables uh, in your favor to tell the story, right? Okay, any other question, comment, Brendan or somebody else? Okay, I guess everything is super clear. That's great. <laughs> okay, no, it's, I know it's a lot of information, but uh, um, I can, uh, we can talk a bit later too. Okay, so the other, I mean, there's uh, one more variable uh, or decision that you have to take and it's uh, what lens to use and it'll, it will also affect um, your image, of course, right? Again, the, the obvious way in which this affects your image is that you get closer to the image or further away, right? So different lenses, um, so like a long lens like this, it's, uh, we call them telephoto. Sometimes people call them zoom, but a zoom is not the right um, way to call it. A zoom is that it's a, it's a lens that can change the focal length, right? That can get you closer or further away. And then you have primes like this one, this is a prime. You cannot, this doesn't change, it's just a static, right? Uh, yeah. the, the one we're using in the camera now here too, it's an, again, it's a, it's a zoom, right? So that's the meaning of zoom. When you wanna talk about being uh, far away, uh, I mean, when uh, like a long lens that gets you closer to the subject, you're talking about a telephoto. And when you are talking about a lens that lets you see everything very wide, you are talking about a wide lens, right? So as I was saying, the obvious um, result of this is that a wide lens like this one here on the left what is this? It's a 1535. It's very similar to the one I have on the camera now. The one I have on the camera, it's a 1635. The one in my camera here. So that's a 16 millimeters. And this is 70. It's like a mid range lens. It's a super useful lens, actually, this one. Uh, sorry, no, this is a 2470. Sorry. So 2470 is, is, is the mid range and it's very useful. So normally you would have three lenses exactly like what they are having here in this image. You have a like a 1535 and maybe these numbers won't uh, mean much to you now, but it's basically the, uh, the distance of the objective to the focal plane is maybe too technical. But anyway, uh, just, just saying that a small number is very wide and a big number is, is telephoto, right? And the middle you are in about 50 is like your eyes. Your eyes is like 50 millimeters. This is a good, maybe a good way to think about it. Um, so your eyes is like a mid range, like this mid lens here that is 2470. Your eyes are a 50 and everything under 50 will be a wide lens and everything above 50 is like a telephoto. Is that kind of clear? Yes. I see you guys just like, uh, what? <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah. But and as, as I was saying, the base, the, the obvious result is that with a, with a wide lens, you are far away from the subject. With a long lens, you are very close, right? That's the obvious uh, difference. But then like the other variables, it also has a secondary effect, right? Which is when you are in a wide lens, you have less, uh, uh, in Japanese we say bokeh, 
So do all the Japanese here understand what bokeh means? Minasan wakaru, bokeh no imi. Yes, I think. Yes, sorry, I was missing. Uh, for the, if you are not familiar, this actually this term is so, is so important that now people use it in other countries in Japanese, bokeh. Yeah? But it's basically the, the, the depth of field. So how much is sharp or unsharp in an image, right? If you have very little areas that are sharp in an image, you will have um, less bokeh, we say, right? Everything is sharp, so there's no bokeh. You know? uh, when uh, you use a telephoto, like in the image, you will have more bokeh, we said, right? These like very nice circles, I'm gonna show you now actually uh, with the camera, but um, it's uh, like this. So like this, we're on a 70 millimeters, right? So it's a little bit telephoto. It's not too telephoto, but it's a bit telephoto. So what you are seeing in the background is what we call bokeh. You know? These blurry things in the background, that's what we call bokeh. You know? In Japan, maybe everybody understands, I suppose. And the photographers now understand this worldwide, I think. You know? uh, so if you see these kind of nice circles of light here, you know? like, uh, okay, for example, this. Um, kind of to make those kind of blurry and people like it a lot. And this is very nice bokeh, they say, right? It's like a nice decoration for your image, right? In contrary, if you are on a, on a wide um, distance, now we are on 24, we went back, more things are sharp, you no? Know? There's less bokeh, right? So this is the secondary effect of your uh, choice of lens, okay? So very often what you will be doing is that, um, very often what you will be doing is that to, sh to shoot like a general images, like a shot of the big city or uh, like the big scene of all the, um, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly, for example, the poverty story, maybe there's, um, I'm gonna just imagine things, but maybe you're gonna shoot some images where the poor people go and get some free food uh, in a park or something like this which I, I have shot myself actually in Tokyo. Um, so it's a huge scene with many people. You want to get all of them on the, on the frame. So you use something like this, right? It's a wide lens. If you want to shoot some very nice little details like you saw on the sushi uh, chefs, very close to the, to the hands uh, or to the face, you will use a long lens, something like this. Right? And then you have very blurry backgrounds and a very sharp, very close image or very uh, wide image with everything sharp, okay? So the, the bokeh is the blur then, the yes. blurry effect, okay, yes. right. You say, oh, nice bokeh, yeah. And different, <laughs> different lenses create different effect actually. No? So yes. there's, there's crazy expensive lenses actually. No? Uh, I mean, I have some kind of expensive, but crazy, the, I mean, the Cine lenses can be crazy expensive, you know, like uh, you should video with a, with a um, like high-end video, like, I mean, a lens can be a thousand, ten thousand dollars. I, I was just being asked to shoot some nature documentary, and and this is like they were asking me to shoot some bears in Hokkaido that are super dangerous. So of course we're not going to shoot them with a wide lens. Uh, we're going to shoot them with a long lens. No? This is a two hundred. I, I they were asking me to shoot it with a one thousand lens, right? So even one thousand, they were a bit like, yeah, maybe it's still dangerous um, to shoot these bears. No? Um, with that, uh, but this lens, for example, is like eighty thousand dollars, right? The lens, one lens, <laughs> uh, so they can get pretty expensive. No? Uh, but then the image you get, uh, it has something, right? Maybe cameraman can notice. I mean, general people maybe will not notice directly, but they would feel that it's better somehow. No, they don't know how, but they say, "Wow, this is amazing!" Like when you see a commercial on TV, it, everything looks so pretty, right? It's because they are using an amazing camera with some amazing lenses. Now you don't know really what, and you're not gonna say, oh, that's an amazing sharpness they achieved. They, you're just gonna feel like, oh, this product is amazing and I'm gonna buy it, right? You just get the, the, the emotional effect of it, right? You don't know rationally why. Right? So that's, that's uh, also how um, uh, the effect that these better lenses have, right? These are maybe this is like a two thousand dollars, one thousand dollar lens, yeah. So it's it's like a nice. These are very nice steel lenses, right? It's not for cine, 
it's, it's not for video, but I, we are using them for video now, this kind of thing. Uh, so it's not optimal, but they do very beautiful image right? at a relatively good price you know, of a thousand one two thousand dollars instead of uh, 20, ten twenty thousand dollars. Right? So that's nice. Any other question related to this? And maybe just one last point with this. It's another secondary effect is that when you shoot with a wide lens, you will be distorting the image a bit. When you, when you shoot with a wide lens, um, how can I say, it's like, a, let me see if I can achieve that with this, is this 20? Okay, let me see if I can achieve this. Um, Wow. Well, this okay. Yeah. Don't need to start with all my things and changing it. Okay. So if you shoot with a wide lens, it will kind of like make a round, more round the faces. Yeah. Especially if you are very close. And if you shoot with a with a closer, it will compress the image a bit. Right? So what they say is that um, uh, you don't want to be shooting, for example, an interview of, or people with a, with a very wide angle because the face will not look so nice. And you don't want to shoot them with a telephoto because it will compress the image a bit. No. You, you can do it, and I do it all the time, right? Depending on the needs. But the, the way you will get the nicest uh, image of the faces of people is with an intermediate lens like a 70, like this one. Okay? So that's the last point on that. Okay. Maybe, maybe so we, we, have, we have about 20 minutes left. Yes, I think I'm maybe gonna make this last point and okay. then um, maybe leave it at that and maybe open for questions or something. Is that good? Sure. I think it's, yeah, it's, yeah, we can open it. Okay, so let's say you already know the basics of, uh, you have the, your, your image is sharp, you have enough light in your image, and now it's where you wanna put in your image, right? And uh, this is, um, what we call them is like a framing. How are you gonna frame your image, right? What, how are you gonna shoot the person, right? How are you gonna shoot this interview? How are you gonna shoot these uh, people in poverty lining up? How are you gonna shoot the dancers doing their performance? Uh, and this is how is the framing of your shot, right? And uh, this is what starts really uh, separating the um, professional, professionally shot video from somebody that doesn't know what they are doing because, and maybe this is the key word in all of this is intentionality, you know, being intentional, right? When you see videos of the people shoot with their mobile phone, you see that, yeah, more or less, it was more or less sharp. It was more or less lit because it's all automatic and more or less it show up what they wanted. Uh, but there's no intention on the shot, right? What, what is this photographer trying to emphasize? No? It's just more or less is there. No? So if you don't, uh, if you just don't use these professional techniques, your, your video will not have this intentionality, right? So you as a photographer have to be intentional. No? You, you have to decide what to do, right? Like what, just, just like what I showed you already, like you have to have the intention to use a shallow depth of field, is your intention to have a blurry background? Your intention is, yeah, you see? So just like that too, is how you're gonna frame the people that you shot, okay? And um, so there's uh, like, a, is there, there's a, a, like a language actually, it's like we call it a cinematographic language of uh, that it's developed over um, a long period of time, right? So of we seeing, people shooting movies and we seeing them and we getting used to this. And now uh, we are expecting this, right? We're expecting that this is gonna be shot like this and they are gonna present the information in one way, right? It's, it's a language, just like when you are reading a scientific paper, you expect to have an abstract at the beginning, something at the end, this in this way, it's, it's a convention, right? So just like that, we have conventions in, uh, when you operate the camera too, and this, uh, it, it, there's a reason and also it will make people feel very uh, 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 at ease or use because that's what they see in TV on cinema and it will make your footage look very professional too. Okay. Uh, 
okay? So um, I'm going to play you a video that I shot using several of these framings, and then uh, we'll discuss them a bit, okay? These are the names, but maybe it doesn't mean anything, so I'm just gonna go ahead and play it for you, and uh, I will explain things, right? So I'm shooting here with my same camera that I'm showing you now, my Canon 5D, and I just have a subject. This is my, uh, one of my interns that I shot uh, near my studio, uh, just to show you this uh, uh, different, uh, different framings, you know, six camera angles that are really useful. I'm just gonna let it run and then I'll explain it, okay? Stop it and um, I'll, run, uh, I'll, I'll explain them to you. So is this, uh, you know? Okay, all right. So I'm gonna explain you just, I'm just gonna run through them and explain them to you. Okay, so you often have what is called an establishing shot. Like um, like we saw in the, in the video about uh, the sushi chefs, we, so we show a little bit of Tokyo and then you know where, where you are. So establishing shot is because it establishes the location of the action, okay? So this is uh, near where I live, it's in Kamakura actually. It's uh, five minutes from where I am now. Um, then you start having different framings that are related to, the, to, uh, to, to people, right? To the, to the human size, right? So you have a long shot. In a long shot, you will see the, your subject and you will see this subject in the environment, okay? You, will, you have a bit um, of the environment and you see how this person, where this person is located in the environment and we call this a long shot. Moving further in, we have a full shot, which is we see the subject from uh, head to toe, head to feet completely, right? Moving further in, we have a medium shot, which we use a lot. So that's from the uh, waist up. We move further to a medium close up, kind of from the chest up. And a close up, which is just his face, right? And uh, you can go to extreme close up, for example, if we just see his his eye or his hands, that will be an extreme close-up, okay? So, no, we're running a bit out of time to have a little bit more interaction with you guys, but um, basically um, this, again, this thing achieves several things, which is which is on one, on, on one hand, it's, uh, it's making your image more interesting because you are, you are showing vari variety, right? You can, you can cut from one image to another to add variety to your movie, which that's, that's good. But also it has a different impact and it, ha they, it has a different usefulness. So here you are showing where the subject is in the uh, location but you cannot really see his face, right? You don't know if he's uh, sad or happy, it's not clear. But if you go to a extreme close-up like this or like a close-up, it can really tell you the emotions of the person. Um, so it can be useful in that way. Sometimes some things, for example, framings and compositions we use and that you can use a lot for, um, your interviews is this kind of uh, mid shot or medium close up of the subject, if you see that. And you see that there's other elements um, around 
that tells you something about this person, right? So you see that it's framed in very specific way, right? Again, this is a bit different because it's a message, the person is looking at the camera, but again, you see that it's very, very uh, intentionally framed in some way, right? So, yes, I don't know if you guys have questions about this in particular. Or you, Brendan, want to say something at this time? So actually most of the um, examples are one, one camera setups, but sometimes you might actually use more than one camera. And in that context, how do you go about sort of deciding how, how to use the two cameras? Um, two camera scenarios, you mean? Yeah, two camera, ca camera scenarios. So for instance, say they're uh, filming in the inside the bar and the dancing, you know, would you, would you have one camera sort of taking in the whole scene and then another camera focusing on the, the faces or, or is that the sort of approach that you generally adopt? Yeah, most of what I do is actually single camera. Okay. Yeah, you can do most of things with one camera. Most of the time when you use two cameras is like you're saying, when there's a scene that is just going to happen once and you really need to get it. For example, I shot an NHK documentary about there's a kite festival, kite fighting festival. I forget the name of the town. They use some kites and they fight each other. Uh, it's, it's a big commotion, everybody running and falling into some river. Um, so, and it's like a huge area, right? And it's all happening at once. So most of that documentary I shot on one camera, but then just for that event, we brought another cameraman, actually three, you know? I was the, cam the photographer, the main photographer. We brought another one and then the director had a little camera. So we had three cameras actually. But uh, yeah, so mostly on those cases um, that for some reason it's impossible to cover the whole thing at once with one camera, but in most scenarios you can do it with one camera actually. So in that case, if you're only using one camera, um, you just have a really good, clear idea about the different setups you want to use for the camera. So sometimes you will do like a whole, what's it, the, uh, the whole room shot, and then you will go into something like a full body shot. Um, maybe at the dancing, it's a full body shot. And then at some point in time, you also want to have the, the face close up, etc. So you have to figure that out. Yes, yeah, so that's that's. Uh, I mean, that comes natural to me already. That's we call that coverage. So you have you need coverage at all levels, right? Like what just what I showed you. You need you need that, right? Uh, you need the wide, the mid, the close of everything you shoot, you know, ideally, right? So with with an with an actual video camera, they have a lens that allows you to go from very wide to very. Um, close up to very wide and it's very easy you know like what you see on tv especially japanese tv they love to do this very zoom in zoom out zoom in zoom out so they have a camera that allows to do this right very high-end camera with very nice lens and allows to do that at the same time of having really great optics uh you can do this also with a cheap video camera but it, it's not gonna look so nice but you can do the same thing of getting close and far away with a camera like this uh, that it's almost like a cinema camera. I have to change my lenses actually sometimes. You know? So I have this one, two, and another one that the, the, the lens I had in the other camera is the, is the widest. So yes, you are changing lenses a lot. Yeah. So okay. it takes a lot of time with like this, but you also doing like this with your camera there, right? So mm. it, you, you just need time to do it like this, to do a proper job. If you want to follow all these ideas and use a camera like this, it just takes time. Okay? okay, um, so you just have to give yourself time to do this properly. You, know? you cannot, you, don't, you cannot expect just arrive and do everything. I, I calculate, for example, in a day, maybe I can shoot three scenes. Uh, well shot scenes, I would take two to four hours, right? Maybe. De depending, I mean, I'm being very general now, no, but uh, uh, yeah, no, like the, the, the piece you saw in the sushi place, that's almost like a full day shot, shoot, full day shoot. Okay. okay, and uh, that's maybe one key thing because in Japan people are used to, if, if people know about, 
they had an experience of a TV crew coming to shoot uh, them. Uh, it will be the classic Japanese TV crew that shoots everything very quickly. Like they come like half an hour with a big camera and then they are, they are doing everything very quickly and then, okay, let's go, bye, finish. No? That's kind of more news style when you have to do things very quickly. But if you're doing documentaries, you are expected to do some good job with your camera. So you will have, you will take time, right? Like this lady that we shot for the sushi piece, she was freaking out because we were taking so long, right? So the first thing I said to them is like, okay, it's gonna take time. It's gonna take between two, maybe it's gonna take two hours, right? That I tell them from the beginning, right? Or when I ask permission, in Japan, people like to be asked in advance very clearly what is gonna happen. So you can tell them, yeah, I need two hours. Can you give me two hours? And then say, okay, it's fine. And then they know what to expect, right? But it will take a long time if you want to do this properly with this type of equipment. Okay. Yes. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Yeah, maybe it was it was like so much information, but I hope you guys took lots of notes and you can Google all of that the whole afternoon or something. <laughs> well, they can watch this lecture again. Um, I'll put it up. On it's true. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, yeah, I, I can. Um, I can, uh, I mean, I'm available. You can shoot me an, an, um, an email uh, or I don't know what, may, what, what form of communication you are using, Brendan, with everybody, uh, but uh, email is fine or- okay. is that yeah. fine? Email is fine, I think. Yeah. Well, how about, how was the level? Um, was it quite challenging for you, for you all? Or for some of you, you already have covered this sort of um, information before? Well, I have very basic question. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, um, uh, you explain things with ordinary camera, right? But could you use the same techniques and words in in the case we use when well, taking films? I mean, video cameras, other types of camera. Uh, can you repeat the question? What's your question? Yeah. Um, you explained today with ordinary camera, camera takes the still pictures, right? Uh, but when we use different types of camera, like video cameras or you know, professional cameras, uh, could we use the same techniques? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. totally. Yeah, just is the same, the same principle supply. Um, right. yeah, and you are right. This is this is a, a, a hybrid now. now. Now most of the high-end uh, photo cameras they can do video at really good quality, right? And uh, because it's relatively cheap, they are not cheap, but they are cheaper than a, than an actual video camera. Uh, people are using them a lot since uh, since a while already. Um, but the same principles apply if you are shooting with a with your mobile phone, with a cheap video camera, with an expensive video camera, with a Hollywood camera. Uh, the, the principles are exactly the same. Right? It's the mm -hmm. photography principles they apply. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, can you guys hear me? Is it okay? Yes. Um, so I don't know if this is the same for all cameras, but I have a custom mode and a manual mode on my camera, and I don't know the difference, what the difference is between custom and manual. Yeah, neither do I if I don't know the model, etc. Uh, what what camera is it? Um it's a Fujifilm XM1. Yeah, I don't know because I don't know that camera. But uh take a look at the at the manual properly a, a little while and then once you know uh, more specific, you can shoot me an email and I can I can try to see what it is because then depending on the brand, they will mean different things. I mean, the principles, they will call the same, the basic things, but then there is little things like that. Uh, like, like my video camera, my main TV camera has a custom mode and a cine mode too. And I'm sure it has nothing to do with your custom mode on your camera. And uh, yeah. But yeah, just send, send me an email. I'm gonna put uh, the last screen, I'm gonna put my email and um, uh, other contact details that you can use uh, to contact me. Right, thank I, you. I will try to reply to questions too. So we didn't, you didn't really get time to talk about it this, this session, but I think it's really important for the students to 
also use a tripod. Yes. Um, don't think about actually going and trying to do handheld. Um, it, it won't work. So really getting used to having a tripod and setting up with a tripod is going to be something you should practice. Um, we do have a gimbal. Uh, for those of you who are even more ambitious, which allows you to keep the camera stable while moving around. Uh, so if you wanted to do some kind of setup scene where you're walking down the street with the camera and you don't want the camera moving up and down like this, then the gimbal will work. But Luis, you know, gimbals are not easy, are they? <laughs> yeah, gimbals. Uh, yeah, there's some small gimbals for mobile phone that are easy to use, but a proper gimbal like this, I have it, uh, a Ronin S, and uh, it's difficult to stabilize them to, to, for starters, right? And then to use them properly. I, I've been using it for a while and now I can shoot with it properly, but it took me a while. So, but yeah, let's, you can keep it simple and start with a tripod. And uh, actually the tripod is something that maybe the thing that will really make your video look very different from, a, from a, an amateur video because nobody's, most people are not using tripods. They are just doing whatever with their mobile phone or their camera with their hand. And uh, it's, it's all shaky and the movements are not well executed. Um, so using a, using a tripod is gonna really make your, your footage look a lot, a lot more professional. And I, I felt it myself when I started actually, because I couldn't get used to using it because I was a still photographer. And I hated it, putting the camera on the tripod. I would put it on the tripod for a while and then take it off and then start shooting with my hand or on the shoulder again. And uh, I did many of, of the movies we did with Brendan in this way when I was starting, but I forced myself and, and yeah, I could, I could see eventually the difference you know, uh, for that. So I, I really recommend it to you that, to do that. Maybe we can talk a little bit about it next class too. Okay, well, we're just about out of time. Um... What I'd like to suggest you do is that Luis has introduced quite a few uh, ideas. So for instance, aperture, focus, lenses, and ISO. And probably a lot of that information has gone like in one ear and, and then out of the other ear. Um, and also for some of you, it's the first time, but I would really suggest that you do some more reading about it. Um, that could be like Luis was saying, read the manual for your camera, or just go on the online and Google some of the basics of using cameras, it will, it will be a very good start. And then I think also what you have to do is just uh, start practicing now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So now is the time to get hands on. And so whatever you have in front of you, start trying to replicate what Luis was doing. Yeah. Start trying to do you know, the opening <laughs> shot. So I go on, Luis. And maybe just to, as a closing, I know it's so much information, but actually, it's a uh, it's it's technical thing, right? So it, it sounds uh, difficult because you don't know it, and it's the first time you do it. But once you know it, it's just a, just a technique, right? It's, there's nothing. It's not rocket science. It's not complicated. It's just just you have to remember these things, and that's it. You no, know? but because you don't know it, and it's the first time, it can feel like whoa, it's too much things. But it's not rocket science. And as Brendan said, the key point here is to go out and start practicing. So I encourage you, all of you guys to go out and start shooting things, even with your mobile phone, uh, your, whatever you can shoot, your friend, your family, your pet, your dog, uh, whatever, but start doing something with these ideas and it, it will, it will uh, come to life what I just told you. Right? So for instance, if any of you want to come and use the equipment that we have here uh, uh, as a members of your team, maybe, then just let me know. Um, I think you have to stop being shy and uh, stop being afraid of this and, and embrace it and, and come and have a go. And then, for instance, just go out on the campus and do some filming. So as you saw, Luis was filming his intern. You could do something very similar to that. And it will just mean that you're actually getting used to one of the cameras and um, you know, doing your establishing shot, full body, face, and so on and so forth. It will mean you, uh, you're taking some of these ideas forward. Yeah. You, even interviews, you can go and interview your, I don't know, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your, your spouse, just whatever, right? You can, in, what did you have for breakfast? Tell us in detail, but set it up as a proper interview, right? And then you will start to see things that are complicated or challenging, and then you will start learning. Just, this is learning by doing 100%.
Yeah, so the more you have a try and push yourself, the more you're going to learn from this course. And, and then you will know what you didn't learn and you can ask me about it no? later. I, oh, I didn't get this, because I couldn't do it. Then you know what to ask for. So right. of course, ideally at the end, when you make your video, some of these techniques uh, will be there and, if, and uh, we'll be looking for that. So for instance, nicely having the, the main interviewee in focus and a nice bokeh, his bokeh effect, something I learned today. Yeah, a nice blur in the background and so on. And also how you are setting up the framing and these things, We're, we'll be looking for that at the end. And I think you're only going to get there through uh, engaging and practicing, yeah. So Luis, do you have any final words? No, uh, thanks. Uh, this was actually my first online class in my life. So <laughs> I was a bit nervous, but I think we did something. <laughs> I hope it was useful. And uh, anyway, we can keep communicating. We will have another uh, class next week, right? Yes, in next week we're moving on. Uh, next week we're moving on to editing. Yeah. So, but and maybe we can talk a little bit about your whatever questions you have or no. So, if you have, yeah, if it's anything that um, wasn't covered on the camera side, please raise it next week, and we can get a response from Luis. Yes, and uh, I don't know if you can see me. Uh, am I sharing my screen? This is my uh, email. And uh, my handle, is that my handle for Facebook? I think that's Instagram maybe. Yeah, but it's my email. You can contact me by email. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for participating and all your comments. Uh, that, that was great. Thank you, Luis. I think I saw a few people giving you the uh, clapping reaction. So that's great. Yeah. Okay. All right then, so uh, we will be also sending feedback around on your uh, presentations. I just, we, we've marked them and uh, comments here and I just need to combine it. So before next week's class, you'll also have that feedback as well. So thank you very much. And uh, please contact me, come in, use the cameras and let's get, let's get moving. Okay, or is see you next week. Thank or you. Yeah. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you.